I would like to introduce uh, Carrie Ann Mendoza, who is a uh, former management consultant, uh, consultant in uh, banking, the local government, and NHS, who uh, left a job uh, to join the Occupy movement in 2011. Uh, she writes for the Scriptonite Daily, is the co founder and editor in chief of The Canary, and has written a book called Austerity The Demolition of the Welfare State and the Rise of the Zombie Economy, which has been incredibly well received. Uh, you're going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes? And uh, then we're going to turn to audience questions. So, thank you very much. Uh, everyone, clap and cheer, please. Hi, uh, I find it really weird to, to speak sitting down. So if no one minds, I am just going to stand up and walk around a bit. Um, yeah, um, so the, the talk is murder by austerity. And, um, and the reason I'm, I'm here and I'm motivated to take a stand against austerity and why I write Script Tonight Daily and why we founded The Canary, um, which is just six months old, but totaled 3.5 million readers last month, and we're set to crash through 4 million this month, is because austerity is a lie. It's a very dangerous lie, and it's probably the biggest lie that's been perpetrated on the British public and the European and American public, certainly in modern history. Um, I just kind of want to take people back to, to where austerity began. You know, this isn't a new phenomenon, as you've heard from speakers earlier today. This doesn't just start in 2010, this concept of austerity. Um, I like to think of it as almost a kind of a, a group of maraud like a marauding horde. I like to place them on horses, and they've got spears. <laughs> and they've kind of rampaged over Africa and Latin America, and destroyed um, whole national economies there. And now that marauding horde has arrived in Europe. And it's really important to understand the backstory of austerity. Um, and I find, it, find a fascinating figure. When I was putting my book together on austerity and I was looking into the history of this, and you look at this kind of the 80s and the 90s and the rise of this sort of international development concept of, you know, we're developing the third world, you know, live aid, band aid, you know, we're the heroes in the West and we're going to go and fix um, these poor areas that, bless them, haven't civilized themselves enough to get their economy together, which is an incredibly dangerous and paternalistic narrative, which has driven some of the worst ideas in history, but nevertheless continues to gather momentum. And I found a truly stunning figure, which was for every pound in foreign aid that was paid to those countries, the debtor countries from creditor countries, primarily in the West, five pounds was given back in debt repayments. It's like, who is developing who? Who is paying whose bills? You know, and it was, it was like if that single figure alone was mentioned at Live Aid or Band Aid or, you know, or Comic Relief or any of these situations, I think people would have a much greater understanding of the causes of these national economies across the world that have collapsed. And it's because they've collapsed under the weight of funding our banks, of funding our corporations, and to some degree funding our way of life. Because whether we like it or not, we're kind of caught in as minor beneficiaries of this system too, you know, in relation to those groups. So then we have the financial crisis happen. And I'm just stunned at the way that the neoliberal kind of institutions managed to spin out of this enormous crisis, which you would think in any rational world would have been the end of them. You know, they manifestly failed to, you know, do what they said on the tin. And you have this situation where you have this financial crisis, entirely man-made, entirely foreseeable, entirely contrived, and you see it happen. And you know, the way, you know the way that they've done it. And then they turn around this narrative and say, the reason for this crash is not because banks created toxic derivatives in the form of collateral debt obligations and credit default swaps and crashed the global economy and a significant number of businesses and banks and homes with it. But we spent too much on nurses. We spent too much educating our children we spent too much helping people with the least. So what we need to do to get our economy back on the track is stop all that. You know, every, 
every progressive measure that would guarantee some form of social mobility in any society, you know, a decent national health care system, a decent national education system, decent social housing, which is affordable, which means people can then use the rest of their money to participate in the wider economy. Yeah, we've got to stop all that. And it magically will all get rich. And it'll be brilliant. You know, and it's paradise. And it's, so, it's, just, it's just such a profound fairy tale. You almost can't believe people are buying it. But we do live in a country, unfortunately, where the national media, the mainstream media, is kind of owned by about six rich white guys who are primary beneficiaries of the status quo, and they get to shape the narrative, and they shape it every day. It's almost unavoidable to take on these narratives because they're in the paper, they're on the news, they're in most of the primary sources that people would go to and have easy access to, they're all aligned telling this same story. And obviously there was a betrayal within the Labour Party as well that actually meant that there wasn't even you know, that kind of robust political opposition where another mainstream party was saying, this is a lie. You know, we refuse to become complicit in this lie. And they went the way that they went. And I'm certainly excited to see Jeremy Corbyn challenging some of those narratives now, like the likes of Caroline Lucas and members of the SNP, and actually lots of grassroots activists up and down the country have been doing throughout that whole period of time. And I think everyone engaged in that struggle needs to take a moment to acknowledge themselves for doing that in the face of no agreement because you're called cuckoo and radical and crazy for for simply being rational and look at and looking at the evidence and basing your worldview on that rather than these you know crazy neoliberal conspiracy theories which is what they are they're conspiracy theories they're baseless and the reason the talk is t entitled Murder by Austerity is because while we might rail against austerity in principle, it's also important to rail against, rail against it in practice because this is not a victimless crime. You know, this is not just some superficial ideological difference between left and right that we can kind of argue over with a glass of red wine and a cigarette. People are literally dying. You know, people are having their, chan their life chances, their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations taken away. And a really stunning figure that I was looking at recently for the work we're doing on the Canary is that suicide rates from the 2010 to now are actually up 25% in Britain. 25% more people are choosing to end their lives themselves than continue to live in a world that is so unfair. There have been there's a recent study by um, Oxford University and Liverpool University, and they actually discovered 600 suicides that were directly linked to austerity policies in the UK. So 600 people literally ending their lives as a direct effect of those circumstances. So it's a shocking, shocking figure. If you look at the website Callum's List, there's a, a greater number there. And then when you look at people who are suffering terminal illnesses and, dis and disabilities or living with terminal il illnesses and disabilities, the picture gets even darker. You know, the one year that we were allowed statistics because the Department of Work and Pensions immediately stopped releasing these figures, 10,600 sick and disabled people died while going through the ATOS work capability assessment process. So this is people that are dying of cancer, dying of other terminal diseases, have long-term critical disabilities, that in their time of need, when they should have been focusing on being with their loved ones, coming to terms with their conditions and illnesses, were forced through this kind of sausage machine, forced, dragged out of their homes effectively under the mandate and the threat of having their financial lifeline removed and told that they needed to go and prove to somebody that they were worthy of 53 pounds a week or slightly more. These are peanuts compared to the size of our economy. And while that process happened, 10,600 people died. 3,000 of those people had been declared fit for work and had had their benefits removed. This is not civilized. This is not human and it's not humane. And I think it's unacceptable, 
not just in the 21st century, it's unacceptable in any century, any country in the world, anywhere. And just to bring those statistics to life, so I've written several pieces on several people's personal stories. One of them was a chap called Colin Trainer, who suffered, suffered um, a stroke just before Christmas a, a few years ago. He's in his late 40s, he's got an 11-year-old son. He suffered a stroke, he was blind in one eye, paralyzed down one side of his body. He could barely speak or feed himself, and he was learning to try and walk again, but he couldn't yet. He was dragged into a work capability assessment, during which he had a heart attack, which killed him. His son loses him, he dies, and about six weeks later, a letter comes through, the letterbox from the Department of Work and Pensions, to say that he'd been declared fit for work, and he was gonna have his benefits taken away from him. And this, is what his fa this was a love letter that his family got from the government that, in their world, killed him. You know, he may not have had a heart attack that day if he hadn't have had the pressure. And his son actually said, you know, that my dad was a mess before that interview. He'd worked all of his life. He didn't want to be going cap in hand to the state. But that, those were the circumstances he found him in. There's also another woman called Linda Wooden, who's 49. She had a lung transplant a lung and kidney transplant. And she was forced to attend a work capability assessment shortly prior to this operation. And literally as she was dying in her hospital bed, that letter came through to their family. Linda's been declared fit for work. Her benefits are gonna be removed. And I never for the, the quote that her husband gave to the media at the time was, you know, while I was there listening to my wife die and choking on her own bodily fluids, she was declared fit for work by the government. So there were real costs. And prior to these costs in life, and in some cases liberty, in the United Kingdom, those deaths have been happening all over the world. You know, and we've attributed them to famine, and we've attributed them to drought, and we've attributed them to these, just the circumstances of life. But these deaths are deliberate. I argue they're deliberate because if you create an economic system, if you create a framework that you know impoverishes people, that you allow banks, and this was you know, one of the famines recently, was almost directly caused by Goldman Sachs. So they're literally betting on the price of maize and staple staple foods going up, and in doing, placing those bets, the, the price of the food went up, and it created a famine across several countries in Africa. And that same year, the average bonus for a Goldman Sachs banker rose to a quarter of a million pounds. So you can tie a direct line between this urge to create mass, massive, massive profits and literal death for the people that those profits are being made on the back of. And it, people aren't only dying, because it's not only people's, people that are being murdered in terms of their literal lives, it's also their life chances and their economy and the, all of the things that sustain them. And if you look around at what's happening in the NHS and education, they all come back to the same, the same tactics that drove the financial crisis in the first place. And I'm sure most of you in the room will have heard the term PFI. You'll be aware of pri the private finance initiative. So you move from a situation where you borrow as a government at, at peanuts to a situation where you borrow from private banks. And it's stunning, the, the Public Accounts Committee, which are the, the parliamentary select committee that are actually responsible for ensuring or evaluating um, value for money for the taxpayer, produced an absolutely stunning report a couple of years ago that said, you know, they didn't even, you know, it wasn't couched ambiguously. They said PFI projects are always, not sometimes, not every now and then, not the majority of time, always more expensive than public borrowing. And that is how all of these new schools are being built. It's how all of these new hospitals are being built. 
And essentially what it's allowing private banking interests to do in the financial services industry is they make a short-term profit on the loans which have extortionate interest rates. It's the equivalent of buying a house on your credit card or with a Wonga loan. You know, it's absolutely crazy interest rates that they're paying back over 25 to 30 years, except a lot of NHS trusts and educational foundations are actually going bankrupt before they ever actually pay off these mortgages. There are about 22 NHS trusts at the moment of 103 that engage in PFI that are, that are on the verge of, of bankruptcy. And what happens when they go bankrupt and they can't pay back the mortgage is that the bank keeps them. The bank keeps the school. The bank keeps the hospital. So you actually now have three NHS hospitals in Middlesex, in West Middlesex, and in Barnet, which are wholly owned by HSBC Bank. Wholly owned. And there are actually 91 other pieces of infrastructure, bridges, schools, <coughs> hospitals, things that we rely on, roads, that are equally owned in their entirety by banks. So you actually have the dawn now. If this, is, if this continues un unstopped, unopposed, you will face in about the next generation, about the next 25 years, essentially the wholesale privatisation of national infrastructure through the back door, through this PFI scam. There will be no referendum, there will be no vote, because it will all be legal, contractual obligations that the governments will have to, have to enforce. It's incredibly sneaky because it's this back door very heavy, you know, very technical, you know, situation. Most people don't know about it. And they see new schools going up and new hospitals going up and they go, well, that's progress. Like, we're moving forward and we're not. But I don't want to end the talk on the negatives because it is, it's quite depressing, frankly, when you look around and people are dying and they're going through these things and neither do I want to make light of what people are suffering. But something else is happening at the same time because I think in every crisis there is an opportunity. And I think what, what is starting to happen with neoliberalism, with capitalism, with our mainstream media monopolies, with our energy monopolies, is that more and more people are starting to see the mask slip from capitalism and neoliberalism itself. More people that would previously have been disengaged with politics and disengaged with these sorts of issues are actually having the chance to look face to face at this system they're living in, they're starting to realise it's a system, which they didn't before. We, it's a post-ideological word, darlings, you know, which was what kind of happened in the 90s. And they're saying, we don't like it. I don't, I'm not sure this is actually consistent with my values. I don't want my kids to have to fight fights that I thought our parents won. I don't want my kids living in tenement buildings. I don't want them unable to get a house. I don't want them to be subject to the whims of a private landlord. I want them to be able to go to university without coming out with £60,000 of debt before they've so much as begun to live their adult lives. And it is mobilising people in a way that I haven't seen people mobilised in my lifetime. And I'm, you know, I'm 34, I'm not 10, you know, and I haven't seen that level of engagement. And it's where that engagement is happening is even more important than it, the fact it is happening. Because it's not just happening in, the, in a sort of academic student world of college campuses. It's not just happening there. It's happening in pubs. It's happening in working men's clubs. It's happening in mothers' groups. It's happening in places which have become politically sterile for the last generation. They're getting angry and they're starting to discuss and organise and rally. And that is thrilling because then there's a fight. You know, then there is actually a real fight that we can take to these people. And you have the rise of political engagement in terms of, you know, the Labour Party now has more members than all of the other political parties combined. Combined. People are actually, the moment that Corbyn arrived and love him, hate him, whatever you feel about him personally, what he did was offered a mainstream choice. Because a lot of people will still go into the mainstream. Because you know, they've got other shit to do, frankly, <laughs> than do what we do. And they rose. They didn't just go, oh, great, Corbyn. You know, some people got really mad. Some people got really passionate. And lots of people went out and actually became political party members for the first time in their lives. 
you know, if you look at people's Twitter profiles and Facebook pages, you have these little membership cards coming up, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing it. So you actually do have the potential in 2020, if not before, because we're going to try and bring that <laughs> forward. <laughs> you have the chance at the next general election, whenever it happens, for the first time in, what, 35, 40 years, to actually have a choice. To actually have a choice that means whoever you pick will create a profoundly different social and economic situation in this country. And that is really something to embrace and be excited about and be motivated by. You know, it's very difficult, I think, in the left, in anarchism, in the progressive space, is we're kind of so used to losing for, for the last couple of decades. We were so used to it. It, it. We've almost become a bit kind of, it's very hard sometimes to get excited and be like, guys, you know, the rally call. And the thing that I say in my book and I would say to you is that I felt like for the last decade at least, and certainly the last five years where things have become so, so pronounced in terms of wealth inequality, is that almost everyone I spoke to seemed to say a very similar thing. And it was like, they're, they're all, if you imagine all of the people in the UK, right, all of these millions of people, all kind of looking over their shoulder, going, is the cavalry coming? You know, where is the cavalry? We really need some backup. Someone needs to come and do something about this. And actually, I think what I realised, I think what you've all realised through the fact that you're even in this room on a beautiful, sunny Sunday afternoon in Brighton, is that the cavalry isn't coming. We are the cavalry. This is our time. We're the people here now. All of the generations that are alive on Earth now, it's our job, it's our duty and our obligation to stand up and say, sorry, but no. We believe in better, we believe we deserve better. And the reason I got into activism wasn't through purely anger. It wasn't through a pessimistic view of hum human nature. It was because I believe that human beings are infinitely capable. We're capable of the very worst and we're capable of the very best and most inspiring behavior. And I think what we need to do and what we are beginning to do in an incredibly powerful way is build that world that better reflects the angels of our nature. And that's where to stand and invite as many people into that struggle as possible, whoever they are, wherever they've come from, whatever their previous or existing worldview. We all need to share this town, this country and this planet together and we can cooperate and more importantly, we can win and we will. So thank you.